for our last module in the course, we're going to look at some of the technologies and alternatives that are frequently talked about to our current energy system of fossil-based fuels. So I have a lot of great material in D2L for you to read, and I especially have two great CNBC videos that talk about energy storage and carbon capture. But the, the three topics we're going to talk about in this final module are the idea of energy storage, the idea of hydrogen, which is itself a form of energy storage, but so significant we'll put it out as our own uh, topic. And then lastly, the idea of carbon capture. So when you look at the intermittency of the wind and the solar, the obvious quote unquote solution to that is to store the energy that it produces when there's not the demand for the energy so that it's available when there is greater demand or during those periods when the wind isn't blowing as hard or the sun isn't shining as brightly and you need additional sources of energy to top off what they produce to meet the demands of the grid. Here are the things uh, that you need to keep in mind when we're talking about energy storage. The first is power density. In other words, how much weight and or size does it take to store a given amount of energy? How long can the battery last? In other words, what's the duration of the discharge? How often can you recharge it? And all of those things combine together to get into the most vexing problem, uh, which is how much does it cost? So let's take a look at this. And I've given you some reading material to talk about the different types of storage. What we are currently most familiar with are the lithium ion batteries. They're our cell phones, they're in the electric vehicles, and they're amazing. They pack a, a lot of punch in that they have very high density. The cost has come down substantially, but they also have some significant limitations. They don't uh, provide a long density, or I'm sorry, a long duration storage solution. Uh, supposedly, if you turn on a lithium ion battery and say, give me what you got, about the maximum duration is four hours. So this would be good to, for example, for a storage facility, I'm sorry, for a, a solar charged facility to keep the power running for several hours after the sun goes down. But it's not the sort of thing that's going to get you through days or even weeks of a low wind and or low sunlight. So there's a great search for the alternatives to lithium ion batteries. The various concepts that you're going to see discussed are things like flow batteries, which are batteries that have different properties and different chemistries. And the chemistries is important because we know that there are certain uh, minerals in lithium ion batteries that are not widely available across the earth. And so there's an issue of being where, where those, uh, those minerals can be mined and how concentrated they are. Then you're going to learn about thermal storage, which is the idea of taking the heat, uh, turning the surplus electricity into heat, uh, pumped water storage. So this is basically creating your own hydroelectric dam sort of thing where you pump the water up. Gravity-based storage, there's, uh, in the video, you're going to see a very novel gravity storage system, compressed air, and then chemical storage. And the main thing of that is hydrogen, which is what we're going to talk about. You're going to, as you watch the video and you learn about these various technologies and as you read about them, and it, but the video gives, frankly, a better technology, what I want you to pay attention to is the idea of can it scale? Uh, in other words, yes, it works in the laboratory, but can you really build it in the real world and will it work in the real world? And several of the technologies that you're seeing, it's, it's proven they can work in the real world. But in some cases, it doesn't scale well. For example, pumped water storage, okay, that's great, but you've got to have a place where you can, that, that has the right geo geography uh, to make that possible. Likewise, you're going to see some of the gravity-based solutions are really, really novel, but they're big and to store much energy in that. And you're like, wow, that's <laughs> it's going to take up a lot of space. And then obviously, what will it cost? So as you watch the video, pay particular attention to what they say versus what has been done versus what can be done. Now, as an aside, storage for the electrical grid has one huge advantage that may open up alternatives, and that is unlike an electric vehicle or unlike your cell phone or your smartwatch, 
the idea of how much it weighs and how much size it takes doesn't become nearly as critical. And that's why, while lithium ion might be right for things like this, it's not necessary to help power the grid. And so those are some issues to keep your eyes on. So what happened with the Inflation Reduction Act regarding storage? There already was a 30% invest, uh, tax credit that could be applied to uh, solar facilities where they built the battery storage right on site. But now this 30% investment tax credit is available for all storage facilities. And that's a huge expansion. Also, they made it so that tax exempt organizations can get a direct payment of up to 50% of what a for-profit organization could get. And you're like, well, who would that apply to? And the answer is municipalities, some utilities, some energy cooperatives that may be formed as a uh, nonprofit. Therefore, the investment tax credit doesn't have any value for them. Well, now they wrote that it would because they would be getting directly money from the treasury. Hydrogen. Hydrogen has been the next great thing for mm, a few decades, and it may always be the next great thing. So why do I say that? The reason it's so attractive is obviously hydrogen is plentiful. It's a natural commodity. Compared to uh, most batteries, it has very high energy density. Uh, you can burn it when it, when it, or I'm sorry, when it's used, so to speak, when it's converted into energy, it has no CO2 emissions. And very fortunately, it burns at a temperature that's similar to natural gas, which is to say it's compatible with a lot of existing infrastructure. Okay, sign me up, coach. Sounds great. However, hydrogen costs money to create. In other words, even though it naturally occurs to use it from an energy standpoint, you have to uh, create it and that means it costs energy as well. It's hard to store in the pure form. In fact, a lot of the storage of hydrogen would be done in the form of ammonia. It would be converted to ammonia. It is, in fact, explosive. If you have any doubts about that, go back and watch a YouTube about the crash of the Hindenburg. And when it's put into a pipeline, it can embrittle the metal. In other words, it's not perfectly compatible with what we have. Let's take a, br a brief uh, look at the different types of hydrogen, and it's important to get this lexicon right because people throw these terms around. Gray hydrogen is what exists a lot today, and in the uh, CO2 world, that's a big no-no because what they do is they use natural gas, run it through a chemical process to create the hydrogen. However, it emits CO2. Okay, how about if I capture that CO2? Okay, then that's called blue hydrogen, and blue is quote-unquote better than gray hydrogen. Best of all, in the eyes of those looking to reduce CO2, is green hydrogen because this hydrogen is produced using uh, renewable sources that quote unquote generate no CO2, at least not in the production. So, what's involved? What it takes is an electrolyzer. You put water in, you then put energy in, and it separates out into O2 and H2. And then you uh, store it, transport it, or use it. And so the electrolyzer is the big thing. And you'll read in some of your readings about uh, production of electrolyzer, electrolyzers and the cost of electrolyzers. How do you transport it? Well, there actually is a transport network. You can see the ship and the, the truck. But the hope is, is that it could also be translated by transported by pipeline. But again, there's that issue of embrittling the metal. What are the likely uses for hydrogen? Well, here's part of the reason hydrogen is so interesting is because in theory, it has very broad uses. You can see it can be used for almost everything. As you get into your readings though, I think you're gonna find some of these are more feasible or more likely than others. And so I look forward to you in, uh, learning that. What about the Inflation Reduction Act? Yes, in fact, it does provide significant subsidies for hydrogen. What's interesting is they create a scale of how clean the hydrogen is. So in other words, gray hydrogen wouldn't get any money under this, this act. Uh, to the extent that carbon is captured and stored, then the cleaner it is, the more money it can get. So you get an investment tax credit of up to 30% or a production tax credit of up to $3 per kilogram with, again, the amount of how much you get being based on how clean 
the hydrogen is. Let's talk about carbon capture uh, utilization and storage in our final video.